19th century left in its wake a forlorn figure, Dobbin, the family horse, soon to be replaced by a fearsome monster that breathed fire and drank gasoline. In hundreds of U.S. towns at the century's turn, Dobbin's demise began with a magic lantern lecture by a traveling salesman. From the early steam cars onward, he told the history of mechanical transportation, a history culminating proudly in the horseless carriage. But many an earth-shaking event has low comedy beginning. <laughs> In place of gasps of amazement, the intrepid lecturer oft reaped hoots and howls from his audience. For though by 1900, more than 40 automobile factories were already in operation, the noisy, smelly, dangerous toy cast hardly more of a shadow on the national scene than this wayward cat. It was a red-letter day when the first auto came to town. No superhighways yawned for the horseless marble. As late as 1904, there were less than 150 miles of paved roads in all the United States. Belching smoke, the thing careened off, outsnorting and outrearing the most rambunctious stallion. Chauffeurs of the period, studying how to drive, step by step from a book of instructions, often learned to start before they learned to stop. Runaway cars became as commonplace as runaway horses. The entire population ran madly behind shouting advice, every word of it wrong. Soon, town and crowd were left in the rear, and the terrifying invasion of the countryside began. The embattled farmer greeted the car with an affection reserved till then for the drought and bold weaver. for me. So the Iron Monster, cheered and jeered, loved and despised, cut a swath across rural America. And the rural America of trackless plains, impassable roads, and isolated farms was never again the same. The growing feud between horse owners and auto owners often erupted in match races. On such occasions, Dobbin frequently made his rival look sillier than ever. No one had invented the automobile. It had just grown like Topsy over the years, the work of many men. Early models weren't built for speed. If they got you where you wanted to go, that was miracle enough. Dobbin breezed home to triumph and disillusionment, for the interest of the crowd was not in the victor, but the vanquished. Silently, without even noticing, the parade passed by. Within three decades, the horse, man's chief means of transportation for centuries, was to vanish almost entirely from the nation's thoroughfares. And this was the beginning. Over Main Street was sweeping a wondrous change. By 1903, production of cars had reached a stupendous 9,000 a year. Begoggle drivers passed in polished metal splendor. There were some hitches, and most of the hitches were still to horses. Races between autos and horses became things of the past. Barney Oldfield, most famous of daredevils, pushed the record to a fabulous mile a minute and beyond. This is a dramatic reenactment with Oldfield himself reliving, years later, one of his great speed runs. This is the real thing. Rare and authentic pictures of the Vanderbilt Cup race of 1906. New Yorkers departed at midnight to attend a contest which started at dawn, covered a hundred miles of curved and rutted Long Island roads, 
and was so accident-ridden it had to be abandoned. By 1914, the year these scenes were taken, dirt track racing was a national sport. When wheels squirted off, as they often did, drivers kept on going. On dry days, dust was kicked into a blinding, choking, almost solid wall. But public interest was stimulated, and new developments tested amid the racetrack's dirt and danger. Altoona, Pennsylvania, they got rid of the dust by building a wondrous wooden saucer which became more oil-soaked and slippery with each passing year. Through the 1910s and 20s, the auto racing craze was at its height. Still bulky and unpredictable, automobiles seemed living things with personalities all their own. Like the horses before them, family cars and racers were given pet names, praised when they performed and soundly cussed when they didn't. the Indianapolis 500 zoomed off on a brick track while old-time cameras cranked. With time out for two world wars, this most famous of American auto races has been held every Memorial Day since. <laughs> 1916 saw the birth of the Pikes Peak Climb. Its course, this hairpin road, snaking in 12 and a half almost perpendicular miles, 5,000 feet up the side of the mountain. Its purpose, to test not only a car's speed, but of more importance, its endurance. For it was the automobile's ever-increasing dependability that was rapidly putting the nation on wheels. More autos meant, alas, more accidents. A problem this inventor solved with a crash-proof bumper, only to discover he had also invented the world's most rapid exit. Another genius devised this supreme test. Kerplunk, plunk, junk. Back in 1916, cars came in every conceivable shape and size. There were 140 different U.S. manufacturers then. Today, there are six. This Denver, Colorado street scene of 1919 shows that the traffic jam had come to stay. On New York's Fifth Avenue, also in 1919, the snarl led to the first traffic lights, complicated affairs operated by policemen in towers high above the hubbub. By 1920, one out of every 13 Americans owned a car. The success of the auto spurred inventors on to new achievements, like this locomotive car with smokestack and coal furnace, which all too quickly puffed into history. The torpedo car was designed to go six miles a minute if it didn't by accident sail straight off to Mars. Probably no vehicle ever looked so fast and went so slow. One inventor attempted to solve the problem of streamlining with the backwards car. He didn't cut down on wind resistance much, but boy, how he startled the other drivers. Francis submarine car was supposed to travel not on near land, but on and under the water. And surprisingly enough, that is exactly what he did, cruising downward until only the smokestack marked its path. Oh, what a place to run out of gas. Most novel of auto inventions was England's Dynosphere, which did away with the car entirely and just used the tire. The driver acted as an inner tube. What a position the blighter will be in if the thing has a blowout. Jawohl, science really marched forward with Germany's rocket car. The first model ran on a track. There was, of course, one small problem. The <coughs> smoke. Years passed in experiment and labor. A new rocket is unveiled. Smoke problem? <coughs> Don't give it a thought. We've got that licked. <coughs> the scientist never gives up. 
Years later, by increasing the rocket displacement, reversing the air intake with the Pramus valve, and converting the Upsilon to an Alpha Gamma and the Fresnel and Bifenol, he's banished. <coughs> Smoke forever! Oh well, back to work. <coughs> Come around in 10 or 15 years for the next installment of Gadgets Galore.